you, your Holy Spirit sent as the counsel, the guide. You said you would light our path. So Lord, any places we need direction, we can get it from you. If we have fear that we know that's not of you, God, for you're a God of peace and not a God of chaos. Fear is not from God. You have given us a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. We lean not on our own understanding about the circumstances around us, but we lean on you, the immovable, unchangeable God. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We seek you and your presence. For in your presence is fullness of joy, joy everlasting. You said you would turn our mourning into dancing. Lord, we need not live in fear and mourning, but we can look to you and rise above and see things the way you see it, not leaning on our own understanding but seeing with your eyes, hearing with your ears what the Spirit would speak to us today. Oh, Lord, we bless your name. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent your Holy Spirit so that we would know your presence. Jesus, you shed your Spirit abroad into the hearts of your children. Thank you, Lord. For in your presence, there is fullness of joy. We want to de dwell daily in your presence. at your table surrounded by your glory in your presence that's where I always want to be I just want to be I just want to be Church, do we understand really the impact of that statement just to want to be in his presence my prayer so often for for us is that we would find our greatest joy in our time of prayer just that place where we're just with the Lord we even understand what that would look like prayer gets beyond an obligation it gets beyond something that we just have to do and fight for and it can be a struggle at times, but at the same time, that our greatest joy would be in the presence, in the very presence of our Heavenly Father. As David said, one thing I desire is that I may dwell in the, in the house of God, to seek Him in His temple, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. May that be our highest joy. I just want to be. I just want to be. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Draw us close in this time together. We worship together with you, Lord God, with others, Lord God, and in your presence, Lord God. Be blessed in this place today, in Jesus' name. Take a few minutes, church, and greet a few people around you today.
All righty, why don't we find our way back to our seats this morning? All right. Well, welcome to the Ridge. We're so glad each of you are here today. A lot of sunshiny faces. It's been a beautiful week. It's a beautiful day. And we're so happy you're here, especially if you're a first-time guest with us. And if you are, I'd like to uh, invite you to take a uh, little guest card that uh, came with a packet that hopefully they got to you when you came in from the greeters. And just take a minute to fill that out and drop it in the offering in a few minutes, just so we can know a little bit more about you. We would just love Love it if you would do that. And following this service, we have a coffee fellowship with some treats and things next door, and we'd encourage you to not be in a hurry to leave. Come on over, get some coffee and something to eat, and make some more friends. So we're so glad you are here at the Ridge. Well, just a few things to uh, go through. We don't. We have a very short list of uh, things, but we do need to go through these. Um, first of all, let me just encourage you. Again, I haven't said anything in a while, but we do have a Sunday school class here at uh, 9 o'clock that meets over here on Sunday mornings, and uh, Paul is teaching it. Paul's a great teacher of the Word. I know it's a group starting to grow again, and I'm very excited about that, but invite all of you to come on in and be a part of that. It meets at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. I have to get up a little bit earlier, but it's it's well worth the time. Sometimes it's, you know, pull yourself out of bed a little bit earlier. We'd encourage you to put that on your schedule. We will have our prayer meeting this week on Thursday at 10 a.m. again. We meet here at the church. We actually meet in my office, and I encourage you to be there if, if you can. Our shoe fundraiser is still going. How's that going? Are we doing okay with that? Okay, and how, how, many, how, long, how much longer are we going to go with this? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's much better than just throwing shoes away that you can uh, have them. Uh, we can raise a little bit of money here and um, encourage you to bring those in. So we have the we have the tote out there for the time being until you hear from us again. And we have the carnival coming up. Uh, that's our next big event on Saturday, August 17. And is the sign up out there now? Okay. All right. Go right ahead here. Let me uh, get you on the mic here. The Rock will not be joining us this year, and for everyone who was here last year, you know that's huge, because they actually took up about half the place. Um, but I'm very grateful to them. They are good friends for this church, but they have another outreach going on. Um, but the good news is we've had a lot of new organizations join us. So far, um, Neighborhood Link, NAMI, Celebrate Recovery, Broken Radiance, SAM, Safe Families for Children, Abundant Life SAM. Um, Fresh Title and Mary Kay have all either completed their form and returned them or verbally agreed, yes, I have the form, I'll get that right to you. Um, still waiting to hear back from Inshore, Prosperity Heights, Satellite Project, Connect, and Park View Nursery. Um, please do pray that we get at least four more organizations joining us. That parking lot out there gets bigger every Sunday that I come to church. And I think, oh Lord, how am I going to fill that? <laughs> and we have a oh um okay well I get this one now that's what I'm looking for um the sign up sheet does have particular booths to be signed up for I chose carnival games to that we can really use to fill the place if we've got the tickets um such as uh like a Hot Wheel race car track. You know, we can make that shorter or longer as needed. We do have some organizations who can't join us this year, but will be visiting. 
and checking us out. I really want everybody who attends the carnival to really feel like we've come to a nice carnival and you know, a good presentation. And we really feel comfortable talking to either you know organizations to us or the organizations that we're visiting. Um, and the scavenger hunt is going to be done a little bit different this year. I was just talking to Barb about it. Um, <clears throat> I'm really looking at how can I increase opportunities for us to really interact more with attendees. You know, instead of having them go to play a game, go to the next zoo, that's great, that's a lot of fun, but I also really wanted to um, give an opportunity, you know, for us to get to know more of who are we and what kind of groups we are and what we believe. So we're all going to basically be involved in scavenging. Um, there are specific groups that say love, trust, faith, break, and pray. So for the scavenger hunt, children will get a card and they'll say, for God so blank the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then one of the booths to our church will have a big sign that says, love on it. And so children would look for the missing word, they'd go to that booth, get the sticker on their feet, and go to the next one. And with the words, love, trust, faith, break, and pray, you really have an opportunity here to kind of tell the core of, you know, a little bit about salvation. Um, so, and please do go ahead and sign up back there. I also have a sign-up sheet for jobs that I need to be done before the carnival. Um, someone with good penmanship to help make all these signs that say love and trust and institutions or directional signs. Um, also someone who has some um, uh, skill and craft. Uh, we have the banner from last year that has, it reads the date of 818. And if somebody is skilled in craft and can make it read, you know, 719, that would be great to save a lot of money. So, 817. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, last year it was 20 of June. So we have to change the day and then the year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so please do look at that as well. Um, I know some people may not be able to be here that day, but if you still want to be involved, that would be a great day. Um, also to help fill the space, I'm exploring the possibility of having a little um, remote control car track. Um, there are remote control cars that can be used uh, by young people toddlers, and, you know, I think we have some that could be used for a little bit older children. So someone who can make that track, make the ramps, you know, um, that would help fill some space. And it's also something that would kind of catch people's eye and be a little bit different. Um, but I would need someone to make it, you know, set it up, take it down, and possibly run it. Um, so if anyone is that kind of, if anybody's interested or into that, um, please note that on the sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. That's a lot of stuff, but you know what? She works on this all year long. And last year, you could tell, a lot of work went into I think I told you that people came up to me and said, how many years have you been doing this? So this is our first one. They said, you got to be kidding me. This is so well organized and so put together. It looks like you guys have been doing this for a long time. So thank you, Virginia. And um just like our other outreaches, it's like uh, everybody gets involved and it just, it's beautiful. Well, we are going to take time now to prepare to give. Um, Eileen's going to come up and share and then pray for the offering. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness abides forever. Now... He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. We don't need to fear giving to the Lord. 
because he provides. And if we keep our eyes, as we, as we were praying earlier, in his presence and on him, and we just obey his word, he says that, that obedience is better than sacrifice. But he also asks us to give. And if he's put something on your heart, make sure you obey what he puts. Don't second guess. I tell you, John and I have been through some years of wilderness, but through all of that, even when we were not attending a church full time and we were doing house church, we were still sending money to missionaries. We always supported missions. So there's always places where God wants you to give. And just it doesn't matter what the checkbook looks like because if you obey God, he's the provider. I'll tell you another little story. One time, I don't remember what the need was. I just remember, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this. I'm, I keep kept the checkbook, and, and there wasn't enough money for some very big need in our lives. And I went to the bank, and um, because I got a bank statement, and it said we had $1,000 more than what we should have had. And I had been adding and subtracting, and there's no way, and I couldn't find a deposit that someone had put in there or that we had put in there. And I don't know how God did it, but we supernaturally had a thousand extra dollars in our account. Now, God's not going to do it that way every time, but I'm telling you, God provides, and we can trust Him. So take, make sure you're paying your faith promises and your tithe to the Lord, and you know, there's always, always other offerings he's asking of you. So make it a sacrifice as unto the Lord today. Lord, we just thank you for your provision, for giving us bread and seeds to sow that we might reap a harvest of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives and all the ways we've been blessed. And we give, not sparing, because we don't want to we don't want to reap sparingly. We give, Lord God, with a cheerful heart today, thanking you for every good and perfect gift from you. In Jesus' name, amen. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one 
like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Father Bob, we are so much thankful to you for this wonderful day. Father, the day of uh, celebrating your resurrection. The day we can gather together in your name. The day we can gather together to worship you, to adore you, to praise you. Father, what a privilege to come before your tabernacle. And Lord, uh, while we are here in this time to hear your word, Father, we want to bless this time. And Lord, uh, please be with your servant. Please be with our pastor. So while he reveal your word to us, Lord, your word would, uh, your word does a mighty work in our lives. Father, we ask your grace. We ask your faith. We know you are God who does speak in one way or another way. 
you are a God who speaks through your servant. You are a God who speaks through your word. And Father, I pray this word would not be just uh, uh, information, but our inspiration. Father, your word that you revealed to your son, to our pastor already, that would be our inspiration. We want to grow deep into your intimacy and we want to follow you. We want to love you more. Even getting deeper into your word. Above we ask your grace and faith. Unleash your spirit. Pour out your spirit. So we will have surrendering heart when you are speaking to us. Above we ask your grace. In Jesus' precious name. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, something got bumped here. And, uh, oh, here we go. And, uh, let's see if we can make this work. So oh, sorry. Put my password wrong. Anybody know my password? Hallelujah. There we go. That's a good one. Okay. That worked. All right. We're back online. So, I don't know. <coughs> Hallelujah. Well, let's uh, open up today uh, by reading in Nehemiah chapter 4. If you have a Bible with you, Nehemiah chapter 4. And we're continuing our study of rebuild. Go ahead, our mic, the next slide. Uh, Nehemiah was given the task by God to leave his cushy job, as we saw in the Persian government, to go back to Jerusalem. And the walls of the city had been broken down. The people were discouraged. The rebuilt temple was vulnerable to attack by the enemies of the Jews. So begin reading right at the beginning, verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall. Of stones. In verse 4, Nehemiah prays, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, where the people worked with all their hearts. There are many balances in the world, things that just need to be balanced right or they don't work. Or water. I heard a guy say one time, he said, my water, he says, I mix my own. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. He says, I don't trust anybody. Um, I don't know anybody that does that, but water has to have that perfect balance, doesn't it? You get H3O and drink that and it'll kill you. There are... Um, we have, like for the farmers, and of course this is always an issue, we need rain and we need sun. And that has to be balanced out. If we get too much of one and not enough of the other, we have a lot of problems in crop production. The, um, you know, all of us have the struggle here as adults trying to balance between work and family or work and rest. There has to be a balance. When that balance is maintained, everything's healthy, everything's good. Um, this is true in people groups. Don't you love it when you're new, the new person that gets hired and you walk in and like everybody's been there for a long time, it's kind of like, how do I fit into this? I've just, you know, I've just put some kind of tension in here because things aren't the way they were before. How do I fit in? And 
That happens in families too when you have a new baby. Everybody's got their role. And the baby comes in and upsets everything. At least that's what my older brother and sister told me. They said everything in our family was just right till I came along and spoiled everything. I apparently upset some balance in the universe that impacted my family in very unfortunate ways. You know, some people enjoy upsetting the balance. Um, there we go. We, we always have one of those out in the playground, don't we? Um, but most of us do not like the uncomfortable feeling of imbalance. This week, our enemies are back. Sanballat and Tobiah seemed to show up every time Nehemiah started making progress. But actually, this account in chapter 4 may just be a continuation of what was going on in chapter 2 with the issue about rebuilding the gates was, was set in between there. In any case, over the past two weeks, we did a perimeter walk around Jerusalem. And we saw the ten gates of the city of Jerusalem being repaired. The security of the city was moving toward completion, and the enemies of the Jews were not happy about it at all. If we understand the historical and geographic context of what Nehemiah wandered into, it may help us understand why they were so opposed to what was going on. At the time, Persia ruled most of the world. In Palestine, which is the territory that had been and would later be, and not, not be again, and then would be again, the land of Israel. That, that's what Palestine is, the overall name for that, whether or not it's Israel at the time. This was a small but very important part or piece of the empire. Nehemiah had been appointed governor over the region known as Judah. You can see there in green. And um, in the region of Samaria, just north of there, Sanballat was the governor. Tobiah was from Ammon, which you can see to the east. So Nehemiah was the new guy in town. He was the one who upset the balance. Everything was going along just fine until he showed up. Everyone had been happy, and all at once this big gun from the king's palace shows up, and he was Jewish. They didn't like the Jews. These guys had been successful in shutting down Ezra years before when he had come in and restored the temple. But they pushed him out and stopped him in his work. So they got things just the way they wanted them until Nehemiah showed up. So indeed, they were not happy. Not at all. And they made it job one to interfere with and impede Nehemiah's rebuild in any and every way possible. Because of the king's favor with Nehemiah, they were very leery to launch an all-out military or physical attack on him and the Jews. However, they did not rule that out if all else failed. So they set about their agenda to interfere and to make trouble. Over the next few chapters, we're going to see a number of ways that the enemies of the people of God tried to intimidate and threaten and halt the people in their work. We will see three of those in chapter 4. Uh, this morning we're only going to look at one of them. We're going to take a bit of a different approach this morning. What we're going to do is go through these verses and see how Nehemiah and the people of God were impacted. And then we're going to go back through them again and see how they speak to us today. The first attack the enemies use against Nehemiah and the people is, as we already visited back in chapter 2, ridicule. Ridicules we've seen can be very painful and very effective in stopping us in our tracks. Ridicule can be especially painful when there's a small grain of truth in it. Is that not true? Or even perhaps a larger grain. Look at the opening jab from Sandballot. What are those feeble Jews doing? That's got to hurt. Not just because it's condescending and demeaning, but because it was really true. They were feeble. Nehemiah came back for that very reason. The Jews in Jerusalem were unable to protect themselves and, or provide for themselves. And they were weak. And they were unhappy. And they didn't know what to do. Ezra had brought them a long way from Babylon, rebuilt the temple, got them established in homes in and around Jerusalem. But they didn't thrive. They didn't improve their lot at all because they were feeble. Next, Samballot chides, will they restore their wall? 
Well, they had hoped to, but now they weren't so sure anymore that they could do it. Because after all, they were just reminded that they were feeble. Will they offer sacrifices? That is, will they actually get this done and then offer sacrifices to God in the temple upon completion? Their enemies are implying a big, no way possible. It will never happen. Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Just look at this mess, rubble everywhere. How long would this take you anyway? Ain't going to happen. Not on our watch, declared the enemies of the Jews. Their arguments did make a lot of sense. The Jews had shown feebleness for a long time. They looked small and they looked weak. So any attack by anyone and the enemies made sure they understood that they were more than willing to be the ones to do that. Any attack and they were toast. You know, every time there's a movie with two bad guys in it, there's one of them that's kind of the, the brains of the operation and he's better looking than the other one and he's kind of the spokesman and the other guy's just kind of thuggish and kind of, kind of slow, you know what I mean? I get the idea that Sandballot was like the first guy, and Tobiah was like the second guy. So after Sandballot says all the things he says, then we see Tobiah, he has to throw in his two cents, and he says, uh, uh, with their building, uh, e even a fox climbing up on it could knock it down. That's how ridicule works. You know, Sandballot, his argument made a lot of sense, but a fox could not knock it down. That was just kind of an extra jab. But if the people were not discouraged before, they certainly were now. How would you have responded? Look at how Nehemiah responded in verse 4 and 5. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Nehemiah, as we have seen, was a man of prayer. He turned to prayer quickly and easily and sets for us a great example. He takes the situation immediately to the Lord. He knows where his help is from. And at the end of the text, we find that the work continued to progress wonderfully after that prayer. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. And look at that phrase. Notice that phrase, with all their heart. This means that they were able to completely dismiss the power of the ridicule. Think about that. They did it with their hearts and they did it quickly because they were able to shut those voices out. We have a hard time doing that, don't we? When somebody ridicules us, when somebody insults us. But see, Nehemiah turned their hearts and turned their eyes to the Lord saying, God's in this. Don't look at the enemy. Don't listen to them. And they didn't. They were able to shut out the voice of the enemy and respond to God in obedience. Now let's look and see how this applies to those of us today. I put out a flock note. Many of you know this week I spent Monday through Thursday downtown at an event called Shift. This was the national convention for our denomination, the Missionary Church. And uh, we have pastors and missionaries and leaders from all over the world there. And it happens every two years. And uh, two years from now, instead of Fort Wayne, it's going to be in Orlando. So I just, just thought I'd let you know that. So, But it's really something to look forward to no matter where it is. It's a time of refreshing and recharge and motivation for those of us in the ministry. They bring us great music and great speakers and have wonderful presentations for us. And I've gone to these many times, not just as part of the missionary church, but during my time serving in other denominations as well. There's a great lift that comes out of it every time. It makes us excited about going back to our churches and, and firing up the things that we have and firing ourselves up. And, you know, you're sitting there listening to these people and you think, man, when I come back, we're going to I'm going to talk to this person, we're going to do that. I'm going to talk to this group, we're going to do that. And, you know, we just sit there and think through all the, all the things. You know, it really, it really gets you excited to come back motivated. And I always look forward to coming back. But this week, as I was sitting here, you know, one of the downsides of that is when you see all these 
great things, and they roll out the best of the best from all over the country and the world for us. You sit there and you think, man, I wish our church could be like that. You know, one of the things you find out about these really happening churches is that they have really young and good-looking pastors. And I only, I only qualify for half of that. I'm still very young. <coughs> but this week, I felt like the devil trying to speak to me as I was watching one particular presentation, and he said, you and your feeble ridge. You and your feeble ridge. What do you think you guys can do? Nothing. What do you think you can do? That's the voice of the enemy. I knew it was the voice of the enemy. I don't agree with any of that. But he's trying to get in there. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to say that. And there is a moment there that, um, you know, I have been praying. So, I should uh, just back up a second and say, in any case, there's a moment where, where, like Nehemiah, we need to pray. I mean, that's the first response, right? When the enemy comes in to pray. When the enemy sends us his junk, we respond with God's artillery, and we take him down. That's what we do. You may be a little surprised at Nehemiah's prayer here. I'm going to look at it again. We've all already looked at it a couple times, but look at the words here. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. This doesn't sound like how Jesus would pray. He prayed to bless the enemies, right? Well, this is a long time before Jesus. And like we looked at last time, one of the things that we do in the Old Testament is we look at things that happen in the natural and then we apply them spiritually. Because, see, our enemies... And my enemies are not flesh and blood. Um, I don't have an army coming against me, standing outside the gates here, people standing here and, and shouting. We pray against the evil and against the forces of darkness. Lord, they're mocking me, and that means they're mocking you. That's where we go in prayer. And so when we pray, we say, Lord, turn Satan's tactics back on him. Release a spirit of confusion over his plans for me. Release a spirit of confusion into the enemy camp for all his plans for the ridge. See, I pray against them. Pray that Satan and his hordes are going to have a really bad day. Release discouragement and terror into the horde of demons assigned against us. Hey, they have emotion too. They can have a bad day, and I'm going to pray that they have every day a bad day. And they're coming against me and coming against the ridge. And this is how we are to pray when the enemy comes against us and ridicules us. Anyway, these words of ridicule against the ridge came to me quickly, and, but I'd spent quite a bit of time in prayer and in God's presence earlier in the day. And so when the devil came and laughed at me about the feeble ridge, in very short order, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you know what? You and the ridge are exactly where I want you to be. Right in the right place. Nothing to worry about. I've got this. You have exactly what you need right now. And I was reminded of the words of Paul from 2 Corinthians 12.10 where he says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's think in terms of upsetting the balance. Satan has his plan in place. He has people in this neighborhood, in this community, in this city that are under his horrid control. Everything in his, wicked, in his wicked eyes in their lives is running smooth like a clock. Then the church steps in. Then we start reaching out and giving people hope. We reach out and start shining the light of gospel in the, in some dark places. And the balance is upset. And just like Sanballat, he is threatened. So of course he will come out of, come after us. Of course he will use ridicule and whatever else he can to try to discourage us and slow us down and stop us. When we, when we leave this building, remember how Andy took all of us to put our hands on the wall? So that's as far as the gospel goes in this room. But we've gone out. We've gone into two places now. We're going to go into more. Where we're taking, going outside the building and speaking hope to people that Satan thought he had them. Satan thought he had them. 
They were very safe and secure, listening to the same voices week after week. And then here, we step into that world and we speak some hope into lives. And it's no wonder. It gets him stirred up. And we need to pray. Our two wonderful hosts, uh, Joe and his family and Kendra and her family, both of them uh, that live in those parks, have had severe attacks since that time because we upset the balance. But we need to pray. We need to take it to the Lord. Among the other insults that Sambalat leveled at Nehemiah, the last one at the end of the verse 2 is quite interesting. He said, can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? As we've been watching them rebuild the gates and the walls, has anybody wondered where they got all of the material to rebuild? At the beginning of our study, the king gave Nehemiah permission to get wood from the royal forest, but that was only to rebuild the gates. Most of it was made up of a long stone wall. This is about a mile and a half all the way around. That takes a lot of stone. Archaeologists tell us, I believe it was nine feet thick. They didn't have trucks to bring it in. Think of the weight. Think of how much that would be. Did you ever wonder where did they get it? How did that happen? That might be an idea, John, but you know what? It was simpler than that. You know, it's not as complicated as it may seem. They were simply able to use the stone that was already there when the walls had been taken down. You know, the enemies came in and tore down the walls, but they didn't go to the trouble to cart it away. They just knocked it down. All the material was right there. They just had to bring it back out and put it back together. So it remained in piles close to where the wall had been. And what is our lesson in this? As we allow the Lord to rebuild this congregation, we don't have to go far to find what we need. It's all right here. Friends, we don't need to send you all to Bible school for four years. We don't need to raise a million dollars. We don't have to replace you. All right? God gave us the people he wants here. I was teaching at a school in Chicago, and um, you know that I spent the last three years down on the south side in the hood. Uh, years before that, I was up for a couple years in another school, which is just about as bad, but it was in the western, the, the near western suburbs. And our, we were in a very, very downtrodden community. Families really busted up and just poverty and all, and, and the school just was not doing a very good job. So the state of Illinois actually stepped in and said, you know what, you guys, well, we were not managed well at all. And that was the problem. So the state of Illinois stepped in and said, you guys can't run your own school. We're going to take over. And the first thing they did, there were a, a couple schools in the system. They fired all the administration. They fired all the, all the uh, principals and all the assistant principals and other administrators, moved them all out. And they told us that if this doesn't help, then we're going to come in and fire the board. Now, the board is elected by the community. But they said, doesn't matter. If this doesn't work, they're gone. And if that doesn't work, we're going to fire the faculty, all of them, and hire all new faculty. Now, I was in a class, and I was co-teaching it. And my co-teacher, Mr. Travis, was explaining this to the kids. And he got to this point, and one of the kids got this really worried look at his face. He said, Mr. Travis, if that doesn't work, do they then have to find new students? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll improve the school by getting rid of all the administrators, all the teachers, and all the students. We'll find some other students. And he assured them, no, it's all about you. This school is all about you. And the same way in the church, you are the ones God wants here. Pastors get in trouble sometimes when they sit there and think, if only I had this person in my church and didn't have this person. And God taught me a long time ago that he puts the people in the church he wants, exactly who he wants, and that's who we work with. There's a unique set of gifts and abilities and shape. Remember we talked about shape, and he takes that. And he'll bring other people in, and, and but, but what he gives us is what we need for the task he has for us. So God wants you here. We simply need to take a hold of what God has already given us. So if you've become inactive, or out of commission, or for whatever reason, not able to serve God for any reason, just get back online. 
we fire the fire. God has given the ridge exactly what he wants at this time, at this place. And we need to take what he's given us and serve him to the hilt. Just like the stone next to the walls, it's all right next to us. We just need to pick it up and use it. It's our responsibility as leadership to provide you with opportunities to serve. It's your responsibility simply to join in where you can. We've given you opportunities recently with the outreaches, and as a church, you have responded marvelously. It's been so exciting to see so many people involved, starting with Riker. I mean, we went to Riker. I, we had this group of people that we we're going to try to pull this thing off with, and uh, we thought we could do it, and we got everything ready. But when we got there, just more and more of you kept coming in and coming in. And when we went back to feed the people went in the room, it's like, wow, where did all these people come from? It was amazing. And that gave us a lot of confidence going forward with the Freedom Fest. And once again, you responded marvelously. It's what we need. We will continue to give you such opportunities. And all of you who have not gotten involved yet need to become involved. And if you can't come to the events, pray for us. We need prayer. We pray for these things a lot before we go out there. But to have somebody praying while we're out there, if you can't go up the heat or if you just can't get around physically, that's okay. We had people behind praying for us, and we need that. That's an integral part of the ministry. Everybody can find a part. Finally, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. You know, in very short order, half the wall was done. The people took advantage of the opportunity they had while they had it. You know, things changed right after this time. We're going to look at that next week. Um, thus far, in spite of Sanballat and his ilk lurking around, the Jews had been able to continue their work unobstructed, day by day. However, following the next things that take place, they're going to have to change some things, and though these things are absolutely necessary, it's going to slow down their progress significantly. And what's the lesson in here for us? Friends, we need to take advantage of what we have while we have it. One of the problems of the American church is that we're so used to freedom and so used to all the, the, just the way we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, that we tend to just put things in the back burner and say, well, we can do this whenever we want, so we'll just do it later. And then it never happened. I'll serve Jesus. I'm really going to get into it. I'm really going to become a person of prayer. It's going to happen later. I've got time. I'm going to get out there and, and I'm going to be really getting, getting out there to share with people and sharing my faith and getting involved sometime. Not now, but sometime. You know, we assume that we're always going to be able to share our faith openly in this nation. And friends, I'm not sure if that's always going to be the case. We're just, you know, there are powerful entities out there in our free nation right now that are blocking and censoring and financially strangling people they don't agree with. And it looks like that trend is going to continue. They find ways. You know, Paul and Peter both wrote in their epistles that the cross would be offensive. And it's become more and more so in our day. People don't want to hear about a Jesus who, ex who is exclusive, who says, I'm the only way, and other ways aren't going to get you to heaven. Well, that's not being that's not being inclusive. That's not being pluralistic. It's not nice. We need to take full advantage while we can to speak openly of his love and tell of his goodness, to serve him openly while we can. We'll serve him when that day goes closed, but right now is a time when it's so open. Let's build the wall quickly, like Nehemiah did. Let's get some work done quickly while that door is wide open. On another level, we could see other, other ways as well, but here's one to think about. I think about this more every year I have a birthday. But serve God while you have your health. That can go away in a day. You know that, don't you? I've been in the hospital with too many people over the years suffer, suffer a stroke or suffer some kind of debilitating thing which is just taking them out, and it happens in a day. Just one day they're there, and the next day, everything they've done comes to a halt. And they're under medical care for the rest of their lives. While God has given you the health and the ability, serve Him now. 
don't put it off for later. Don't put off serving God and reaching out to others, thinking you can do it in that magical someday. Do it now. I want to ask the band to come back up here, and let me just mention this. As a matter of fact, I'd like you all to just bow your heads in prayer. And let me again say, if there's anyone here, and you've been hanging around the church, you've been thinking about God, you believe in God, but you've never fully given your heart to Jesus. You know, Paul wrote, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. None of us know that we're even going to end up at home today, alive. We don't know that for sure. And I don't want anybody to leave without having the opportunity to give your heart to Jesus right now. That you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you die, you face God before you get home today, that you're going to go to heaven. And what we need to understand is the Bible makes it very clear that first of all, we are all, we are all sinners. That we all fall short. None of us are good enough to get in our own. And you know what? We know that. That sounds like it's pretty negative, but the idea is that when people struggle and try, whether they think they're Christian or whether they try another religion, we know that we never measure up. We know that we never do enough. But God sent Jesus. God himself came down to this earth to take all of his sin upon us and die on the cross that if we believe. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He takes that sin upon him, and if we believe in his name, he comes in and he saves us. So if everybody with your head bowed and in an attitude of prayer, I want to ask if there's somebody there saying, Pastor John, I want to know, I want to know, I want to receive Jesus today. If you haven't had that experience, and Jesus called it being born again or being saved, if you haven't had that experience, I want to pray for you today that God will do that in your heart. If there's anybody there, would you just raise your hand and I'll pray for you today. Can I give just a moment? Is there somebody there saying, I, I want to I want to get saved. I want to know for sure. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that has not responded to you, that they will, and you'll continue to speak to them, Lord God, until they do, that we can know that we're going to go to heaven. And Lord, I pray for those of us in the ridge that we will take advantage of while the sun is shining, while we have all the freedoms we have, while we have our health, while we have so much, Lord God, while we have each other, while we have opportunity to serve you with all of our hearts in this day. Thank you for the opportunity you're given the ridge to reach out, Lord God. Thank you, Father God, for the, for the way you've touched lives already, and we want to continue to do that. Just, Lord, let all of us be on board. That we will build the wall all there's time. We will restore. We will allow you to restore in our lives. You will empower us and encourage us to work for you in ministry. And if I have a lot of joy because we do it together, Lord, there's so much joy working together with other brothers and sisters and seeing lives change and seeing people get saved. Lord, what a great time we've had in these last few weeks seeing that happen. Let all of us be a part of this and to do it with great joy. Thank you for this day, Lord God. Thank you for this day. I want to ask all of you to stand with us. So we're going to sing that song again. Jesus, the name above every other name. And I want to make the altar open. If you want to present your, yourselves to the Lord today. And if you've been somebody that's been kind of sitting back on the wall and you've not been engaged, and you know that you need to be. Just come present yourself to the Lord and say, Today, Lord God, take me and use me again. I, I don't want to sit. I don't want to wait. I'm available to you. Let's just, as we're available, let's just raise our hands to the Lord. Make ourselves available. And say, Lord, use me. I'm willing, whatever it takes right now at this moment. Hallelujah.
yourselves to him, church. Worthy of the wrath could ever be declared for you. Jesus, it's your name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Live for you. Declare it now. come to the end of this time together. I just want to pray a prayer over the church. And if you're ready to re-up, if you're ready to recommit, say, Lord, use me. Wherever you are, whether you've been serving God with all your heart or whether you haven't been there, but if you're just saying, Lord, take me right now and I'm ready for you to use me this week and this month, I'm ready for you to use me the next time that you call me to anything, I'm ready. Just raise your hands to the Lord. I pray for you right now. Father, you see your church, Lord God. Empower us. Empower us to be your people. Let us remember the time is short. Thank you for the opportunity you've given. Thank you for the freedom in this land that we can proclaim the gospel wherever we want at this time. We pray that will continue, Lord God. But let us not become lax. Let us not become uh, just indifferent that we can do it sometime later. But let us now, in the opportunities that are facing us now, to be your church to make an impact in this community, in Fort Wayne, and in the world, Lord God, for the kingdom of God. We thank you and bless you in Jesus' name. Jesus, God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Don't forget the fellowship uh, in the next room. Don't be in a hurry to leave.